Hi, this is April. Welcome back to my channel. I decided I wanted to do a little PSA on buying a full frame camera and the reasons why you may not need one. Like you, I watch dozens of camera review videos and the holy grail seems to be full frame and I just couldn't resist craving a full frame camera after spending a year with the Sony ZV-E10. I figured if the Sony ZV-E10 could do so much better in low light than the Micro Four Thirds camera that I had, the Lumix G9, I figured, well, a full frame sensor ought to be able to capture so much more light than that. And also, I have a little confession. I have become a bokeh whore. I just love the look that a shallow depth of field gives. And when I got the Sigma 16 1.4 and put it on the Sony ZV-E10 and noticed that I was able to get the subject to pop out from the background, I couldn't turn back. And I've become a little bit obsessed with the quality of the bokeh, or as Casey from Camera Conspiracies calls it, tone. <laughs> so over the past year, I decided to save up and get a Sony a7 IV and I was able to get one from B&H Photo for $2,000. I know the price is outrageous, but I saved up and then I was able to use my tax refund. But I wanted you to see in this video a hands-on comparison between video and photos using the Sony a7 IV and the Sony ZV-E10 and let you decide if any bump in quality is worth triple the price of the Sony ZV-E10, which you can get for $699 brand new, body only. So the main thing that I do love about the Sony a7 IV is the ergonomics. The grip is so much deeper. It has a nice large viewfinder and it has the flip out screen so you can film yourself. The menus are definitely better organized on the Sony a7 IV. A little bit easier for me to find things. The mode dial is nice and easy to read. You can switch between manual mode, aperture priority, your custom recalls. Everything is mapped out nice and clear. Now, I would say the biggest surprise between getting this and having dealt with the Sony ZV-E10 for the past year is the weight. The Sony a7 IV comes in at 650 grams, where the Sony ZV-E10 is only 364 grams. I'm used to being able to throw this in my purse or a really small messenger bag, whereas this camera is so much larger and heavier, you really do need a backpack if you're gonna go hiking or anything like that. And I just wanted to show you a side-by-side -side comparison. I'm not gonna be heavy into specs on this video. This is more of just a hands-on comparison, just so you can see if the expense of this camera is really worth it, especially if you're someone like me who is a hobbyist, not a professional. As for differences in specs, the Sony a7 IV has a 33 megapixel sensor, whereas the Sony ZV-E10 has a 24 megapixel sensor. So you're able to crop in and still retain more quality on the Sony a7 IV. And I have noticed a slight advantage with that because I'm definitely one who likes to crop in on my photos. Another difference is the Sony a7 IV takes the Z-type battery, whereas the Sony ZV-E10 takes the BW50 battery. So you're going to be able to go a lot longer on the Z-type battery on the Sony a7 IV. And one last thing is the Sony a7 IV has a double card slot where the Sony ZV-E10 just has a single card slot. So if you're a professional and you really need a backup recording in case one of your SD cards goes bad, the double card slot could be a lifesaver, but that's not the case for a hobbyist like me. And one other thing is the Sony a7 IV allows you to shoot in 10-bit 422, whereas the Sony ZV-E10 is still on 8-bit, 
which only makes a difference if you're into color grading. I definitely don't want to get over my skis with this, but if you really like to do heavy color grading, they say the 10-bit footage doesn't fall apart as much as the 8-bit footage. It really hasn't been an issue for me because I generally shoot in the standard picture profile and I don't do any fancy color grading. I only do some minor corrections to white balance and maybe some contrast and things like that, but I don't do any heavy color grading at all at this point. And the Sony a7 IV can do 4K up to 60 frames per second, which can be super helpful if you like to slow down your footage. I love doing that. The Sony ZV-E10 does 4K and up to 30 frames per second, but you can still do 60 and 120 frames per second in 1080 on the Sony ZV-E10, which I don't think the 1080 looks as bad as some people might say. One feature I do love about the Sony a7 IV is the switch that lets you go from photo to video to s &Q mode which is similar to the button on the Sony ZV-E10, which lets you go from stills to video to s &Q. And I've come to like that a lot, so I was glad it carried over on the a7 IV. So two of the main things I wanted to show you are a comparison of the photos taken with both the Sony a7 IV and the ZV-E10. They're not exactly fair comparisons, mind you, because I had an 18 to 50 millimeter Sigma lens for the Sony ZV-E10. The aperture goes to 2.8, whereas on the Sony a7 IV, I have a Sigma 28 to 70 millimeter lens that goes to 2.8, but 2.8 on a full frame camera lets in so much more light and you get a much shallower depth of field than you would on the Sony ZV-E10 using the Sigma 18 to 50 millimeter lens. But I tried to keep everything as close as I could. The other test I wanted to show you is a vlogging test. I just wanted you to see the separation of me from the background in both of these cameras. On the Sony a7 IV, I used the 16 to 28 millimeter lens. And on the Sony ZV-E10, I used the Sigma 18 to 50 millimeter lens. Both of them shot wide open. And I also tried to do a test on the Sony ZV-E10 with the Sigma 16 open to 1.4, just so you could have a comparison. They're not perfect but it gives you a better idea of whether upgrading to full frame is really worth the expense. So this is the Sigma 16 1.4. I'm shooting wide open at 1.4 with an ND filter on. This is on the Sony ZV-E10 with steady shot turned off. Now this is on the Sigma 16 to 28 on the Sony a7 IV. I'm finding myself doubting if the bump in quality that you get from the full frame sensor is really worth three times the expense of the APS-C sensor. The weight on this alone might make you reconsider getting full frame. I would suggest if you want to try a full frame, go to a company like LensRentals.com and maybe just rent one for seven days so you can try it out for yourself. Never spend your money based on the hype of content creators. I've learned that the hard way. Also consider the price of the lenses for full frame. Now I was lucky, I was able to get this used Sigma 28 to 70 millimeter lens for roughly $600 on eBay. But if you want a proper Sony G Master lens, those things can run well into the thousands. And the weight on some of those 24 to 70 millimeter lenses runs over 800 grams. This one's just a little over 400 grams. So I think I hit the sweet spot. The one thing I've learned through this whole experience is that shallow depth of field isn't everything. I'm finding when I go and do landscape photography, I'm shooting at f11 because I want most of the background to be in focus. So don't get caught up in the hype of camera review channels and think that full frame is superior or that a blurry background reigns supreme because let me tell you, it really doesn't. Every camera has its strengths and weaknesses. And on this channel, I never wanna influence you to buy a certain brand 
or that a certain sensor is better than another. I wanted to see for myself a comparison between some of the cameras that I was considering buying, and I thought it would be good to bring you along for the ride, but I never want to influence you to make a wrong choice or to feel that you have the wrong type of camera brand because every camera has its good points. Micro Four Thirds might not be so strong in low light. It's amazing for landscape photography. It gives you a deeper depth of field and it's amazing for bird photography because you're able to crop in so much easier than you would with a full frame camera. And Micro Four Thirds is known for having beautifully stable footage. And yes, the full frame camera is gonna do better in low light and have a more shallow depth of field, but it comes with a really hefty price tag and the weight can get excessive. APS-C sensors fall somewhere in between micro four thirds and full frame. They fall somewhere in the middle for low light and shallow depth of field, but the weight is perfect for me at least. So do your own research before you buy anything and don't let anyone persuade you to spending money that you don't need to in these hard times. If you like this video, give it a like, consider subscribing for more camera reviews from a newbie like me. God bless. <music>